So good morning. Welcome to this month's Federal Fiscal, Fiscal Office Hour. We're glad you could join us today. Our fiscal team members will introduce themselves when they get to their slide. And then that way, it's not just a, a really long intro. Um, for today's session, we're looking at the following agenda. So we're going to give you some overview of program performance reports and remaining funding that we have currently in play with a multitude of our grants. We have risk assessment that teams are now going to be currently engaging in. So just want to provide you a little bit of information regarding that and what that looks like on the DOA, DOE end and then how that then impacts you locally. Um, FY25, preliminary allocations, conversation around that. We're going to provide a little bit of insight and technical assistance regarding contracts and substantial approval, period of performance, and then each of the teams have a mini update that they can provide you with um, grant-specific information that you may find helpful as you continue to work on the grants for the rest of this grant year. Of course, if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. We will address them either as we go, either via the chat, or we can. We do have a session at the end of this meeting where you can ask and pose those questions. Um, so either mechanism is fine. So performance report timelines, we just wanna draw your attention to the performance report timelines and due dates. You can see here, all the due dates are in red because they are now all past due. So if you've not yet submitted a performance report for IDEA, ESEA, adult education, and ESSA, we strongly encourage you to work with your colleagues as quickly as you can to get these reports submitted. You'll note in the ESEA and IDEA sections for FY23 performance reports, if they are past due for your district, your reimbursements are currently paused until those performance reports are received. So we're trying to make sure that we can catch up and have that funding reported accurately before subsequent reimbursements go out. If you have questions regarding those pieces, um, for ESCA, I would reach out to Tyra Corson initially for reimbursement questions, and IDEA would be Colleen O'Neill. We'll skip too many. So regarding funds, this is the other piece we also want to make you aware of. And we are very aware um, at the DOE that you have a lot of grants that are closing out within the next few months. Um, but there are a lot of balances that remain outstanding. Um, so for ESEA, you can see there's two grant years that are currently in flux. And there's close to a million dollars that remains, or 1.2% of FY22 funding that is still on the table that needs to be drawn down. And then for ESEA FY23, we have $7.2 million, which is approximately 10% of funding that remains available. I will say regarding ESEA FY23 funds, we have requested a tidings amendment waiver. And what that essentially does, it extends out the period of availability by 12 additional months. So you would have an additional year to utilize those funds. So that would go through 930, 2025, but we're still waiting on approval for that from, still waiting for approval of that from the federal government. So we can't necessarily bank on receiving that approval, which is why we wanna make you aware that there's $7.2 million that still needs to be drawn down before the end of the year. There may be the possibility that we get an additional year to use those funds, but we would hate to have to return a substantial amount of money such as that to the federal government because it has not been spent down. So we want to make you aware of that. Um, for IDEA, we have um, $46 million remaining of the $56 million award. So there's a significant amount of IDEA funding that remains on the table for FY23. And then similar for adult education and ARP ESA 3. So for adult education, we have over a million dollars that remains. And then for our ESA, we have um, 144 million remaining of the 370 million that we were appropriated at the beginning of the emergency relief funding. And just a, an, another area of note, there are 44 districts with over 50% of their allocation remaining, and that totals $83 million. So really just encouraging you where possible um, to get those reimbursements in and get that, those funds drawn down 
um, because we don't want to leave money on the table and have to retain it to the federal government in short. Questions regarding adult education and ARP, um, they can go to um, Shelly Chassie Jondro or Maisha Asher. And I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Shelly. Good morning, everyone. As Jeanette said, my name is Shelly Chassie Jondro. I'm the director of the Office of Federal Emergency Relief Programs. And we just wanted to touch upon uh, the risk assessment and how that is conducted annually and what that entails. So the risk assessment is really a component that will analyze and assess the program specific fiscal risk, as well as the programmatic risk based on certain criteria. We've provided you a list of the criteria here. One of the one in particular that I wanna draw your attention to because it relates to some of the information that Jeanette just shared is the past performance. So when we talk about past performance and taking a look at every district when we're conducting the risk assessment, we really are looking at different components of the work, i.e. timely submissions of reimbursement requests or on-time submissions of performance reports. So both of those items were just discussed in our two previous slides and we provided some documentation or some da a data set. So using ARP ESER 3 in particular, we know that there's still 40% of our districts who have not completed the performance report for ARP for ESER funds in general, that will be noted on your risk assessment analysis when the team conducts it. We have already conducted it and, and have made outreach to our districts, but other teams will be doing a similar process in the next couple weeks related to the risk assessment. So keeping all those things in mind is really important and how we equate the type of support that is provided once a risk indicator has been um, identified. So as I mentioned, every year the federal programs team, so that IE, the ESER team, also the ESEA team, the IDEA team, CTE team, must conduct this risk assessment because it is a requirement of the federal government so we use a process that was established by the offer, Office of the State Controllers. Uh, so that's Maine's Office of the State Controller. And there's specific questions that are posed by the Office of the State Controller that each team answers based on the information associated with their federal program. So as I mentioned, the risk assessment is to identify potential risks, both, both from a fiscal side and a programmatic side and then analyze the potential for waste, fraud, and misuse of federal funds. And once an SAU is identified as high, medium, or low risk based on the risk assessment, that will determine the level of support that is provided to the SAU and the additional documentation that we would like to see collectively as individual offices in the department. So we just wanted to give you a preview of what those questions look like. So the Office of State Controllers requires, as I mentioned, each federal program to respond to the questions that you have on your screen. So for every SAU, we are looking at your award amount. We are looking at your accounting systems. We're using the information that we have in-house to be able to respond to these questions. You will see, again, that there are programmatic questions and there are also heavy fiscal questions. So did the entity stay on budget? Were funds returned? Was invoicing submitted on time? Were there single audit findings? All of those questions and the, and the way in which we respond to them are based on this Office of State Controllers um, assessment that we must do. So Lisa has a question in the chat box. Can we get details of why your risk has changed? or how it was determined. So I would encourage you specifically to reach out to the, the programmatic staff that you've received that risk level and they can walk through those questions because as you can see, embedded in the Office of State Controllers questions, there are some opportunities for each team to denote other high risk items such as 4-H, which is high risk of out of compliance, and also 6A, which is other issues that may indicate high risk of noncompliance. So those are two areas that each team 
sort of denotes what potentially may make them high risk. So I'm going to just speak from the emergency relief funding component of the work. If you in, in bed, in part in some type of renovation, construction, or remodeling with federal emergency relief funds, that was an area that was a higher risk than maybe some other potential uses of funds. So each team has an ability to embed some additional questions within 4-H and 6-A. I can take this slide. So for our FY25 grant allocations update, um, ESEA federal programs, they've received their allocations on April 9th, and the tentative release that we're planning on for those funds is this coming Friday. So tomorrow you should be getting information regarding those allocations. So that would be titles one through five. IDEA has a tentative release date of the first week of June. So you, you can expect to receive your IDEA related allocations that week. Um, adult education is currently scoring with new awards tentatively, tentatively scheduled for mid-May. And then Perkins, notification to local school districts, and we're going out the week of 422. And then the hope is that FY25, FY25 application should open tentatively beginning on Monday morning. Um, again, if there's any changes or updates to those schedules, each of those teams will be in communication with you. Um, Regarding the ESEA federal programs elements, a notice will be going out via Grants for Maine and um, the public newsroom tomorrow. And once those allocations are finalized, reviewed, um, and published. So be on the lookout for those communications um, over the coming weeks and months. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tyra Corson. I am the ESEA management analyst. And I approve all of the invoicing for titles one through three, five in school improvement. I just want to bring this to your attention, the um, contracts and substantial approval dates and how they go hand in hand. A contract should not contain any dates before the substantial approval date of the award grant that is supporting the cost for the contractual services. Now think about all the dates that could possibly um, show up on your contract. Date of agreement, start date, end date, date it was signed, um, payment due dates. Those are all dates that could potentially show up in your contract. And if any of those dates are prior to the substantial approval date of the grant award, then you would not be able to use that grant to support the contractual services. A contract um, start date and or obligation date cannot be amended. A contract amendment can extend an end date, amend scope of services and or add funds, but it cannot change the start date or obligation date after the original contract has been signed. Slide nine. So the period of performance is important because the obligation, work, and payment must all take place within the same period of performance. It is possible to split a service between two open grants, but be careful because the obligation, work, and payment must all take place within the period of performance for both grants. So generally, this would happen during the last 12 to 15 months of a grant in the first 12 to 15 months of the current grant. And this is just screenshots of grants for me where you can find your period of performance. Um, keep in mind that your period of performance does not start until the substantial approval date. Good morning. I am Maisha Asha. I, uh, I am the fiscal coordinator for Federal Emergency Relief Team. Uh, we have started um, the monitoring process for our ESER grant. 
our all of our uh, SAUs who are identified as um, moderate and high risk category, they have they must have re uh, received all those all the emails that we have sent. And um, as Shelley has mentioned, uh, this monitoring process is a uh, federal and state laws requirement. And uh, and our entirely risk assessment is entirely based on uh, the criteria um, that um, our uh, yeah controller's office has um, provided, and which are size of the award, automation of the account accounting system, program complexity, internal entity risk, and past power performances. So. Uh, and the objective for this monitoring process is to ensure that the program that are operated by different SAUs is, are meeting the minimum fiscal and programmatic requirements. So um, in doing that, uh, you know that um, the self-assessment, the first step, the self-assessment for all high and moderate risk SAUs are due tomorrow. So this is a, a very simple um, Google form with some of the questions where there are, there are five, six questions where you have to uh, grade yourself based on those um, categories. And um, the people who are ad administering the ESER grant from your side, any one of you can um, you know, fill out that form. And for us, the purpose of this form is to, you know, uh, to identify the SAUs with their level of uh, support needed so that we can allocate our resources accordingly. So it's just a support purpose. I mean, uh, um, for, the, for this, uh, to identify what level of support needed from us for our SAUs, um, we have developed this um, Google uh, self-assessment form. And uh, for the next step, for the high risk SAUs will be, will be to complete the desk audit materials, which is due by May 10th. So Maisha, we've got a couple of questions in the chat. Um, Shelly's gonna take a look at, Dawn posed a question if we've not received notifications of our status. And um, so Shelly's taking a look at that for Dawn. Um, where do folks find the self-assessment if they're looking for that? I will put the link in the chat box as well. Thank you very much. And then- I just know that I'm on deck, so I it'll take me just a few moments to get to that information. Yeah, no worries at all. And then the next question was from Wendy, who at the district level received notification of the monitoring? So the superintendent received notification of the monitoring. So Wendy, I can take a look. Um, I know that you support multiple schools. So if you don't mind refreshing my memory, I don't wanna miss any of our public schools that you support. And as I mentioned, I knew I was on deck. So if you folks don't mind being patient, I will get that information to everyone that I promised in the chat box. But essentially what we are encouraging you folks to do is take a look at our wonderful designed ESER dashboard. Essentially what this dashboard does is it gives a monthly update of where all of our districts are financially within regards to their reimbursement. So at the top of the hour, there was a slide that indicated we had, we as emergency relief programs still have 44 SAUs that have over 50% of their ARP ESER 3 allocation remaining that has yet to be invoiced. And I think it's key to remember the information that we have on hand. So the information that we have here on this um, dashboard is all based on reimbursements. And again, the data that we provided in the earlier slide is based on reimbursements. There is a likelihood that you have expenses um, within your budget that you've already expended for projects that were approved in your ARP ESER application. However, if you have not submitted an invoice for those expenses, we are not aware of it. And that's what we, we, we wanna be sure that we're using the, the terms appropriately. So this dashboard 
indicates the dollar value in which you have requested reimbursement for. So if you're thinking to yourself, hmm, I wonder if I'm one of those 44 districts, you can find that in GEMS as the emergency relief funding program still lives in GEMS or your colleagues, your stakeholders, your community members might be viewing this dashboard. And I think it's just a friendly reminder that um, you folks continue to, to have this information available for conversations that are ongoing. Now, I know somebody posted in the chat box, but for some reason that is not me because I'm talented, but not talented enough to talk and put a chat box. So my apologies. Hello, I'm Jody Truman from the Child Nutrition Office. Um, I just wanted to highlight some of the nutrition reports and the locations on, on our website, on the DOE website. Um, we've been getting um, calls from uh, some of your auditors with um, the location, needing the location of some of these reports. So the data reports that were originally on NEO are, um, are located at that address, the CFDA and the MAFS revenue codes for the federal and state income that you receive. So take a look at those. Um, and I just want to also mention it is important that you are distinguishing between your federal um, income and the state of Maine income. Um, so just keep that in mind. So uh, an upcoming, some upcoming um, things to note is we have the a new school meal equivalent uh, equipment and program improvement fund that was just approved by the main legislation um, applications will be coming um, oh we'll be opening that on April 29th uh, Michelle Bisbee is the contact person for that fund and she'll be holding holding office hours and her email address is listed there if you're interested um, in learning about that. And that again is main funds for that uh, equipment grant. And in the MEFS chart account code, it's listed there as well for the revenue code for that. Um, also on May 16th, I'll be having an annual financial report webinar at 1.30. Um, just a reminder that when these were, when we um, report the annual financial report is due, at the end of the school year um, due uh, by September 1st. So once you close out your books and it is, we um, the child nutrition, either manager or director, they are the ones that have to submit that form. However, we do recommend that both business manager and school nutrition work together uh, for accurate data that is submitted to us. Um, I have had a couple of questions on some audits that have come through where they found an error in 23 um, and what to do about um, their financial report. And that answer is just indicate that on your 24 uh, annual financial report and you'll just keep notes um, in your file of the audit and what the change was. Um, for your beginning balance. And that way, when you get reviewed um, by our department, you have the back of documentation to show why the change happened. And I think that is it from Child Nutrition. Jody, could you um, put the link for the annual financial report in the chat so folks can I will. access that? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'll do that. All right, some updates from the ESEA federal programs. Spring monitoring is in full force right now. We're in the final phase for our FY24 monitoring. Spring monitoring results will be released on April 30th and the deadline to resubmit for any unresolved issues will be May 14th. All SAUs with outstanding items in any of the monitoring cycles, fall, winter, spring, have been notified. Please get those items back into us so that we can close out um, the FY24 monitoring cycle 
before your FY25 applications are due. Um, the SAU's FY25 GAN will have your new monitoring status for the FY25 monitoring cycle. If you have expensed an invoice for all your FY22 or FY23 funds that you intend to use and have an approved performance report, please make sure to go back into your application into the performance report pages and close out your grants. Um, and uh, the upcoming deadlines are about the funds that are expiring. FY23 tier three school improvement funds will expire on 930. And there's over a million dollars still remaining. This impacts 72 schools across the state of Maine. And that's all I have. Good morning, I'm Colleen O'Neill from the fiscal team of the Office of Special Services and Inclusive Education. Um, last Friday, we sent out communication about an extension given to the FY22 IDEA and IDEA ARP funds. Um, we know some districts had some difficulties getting invoices submitted for the timeline. So those those four grants, the two preschool grants and the two um, school age grants for FY22 have been reopened for a period of 30 days. Um, this is a one time chance to get those invoices or an, an, an invoice, one single invoice submitted for the remainder of those funds. Um, if you are unsure um, what you have remaining, please reach out. I'm happy to let you know. Um, some districts, it is very worth them taking the money and some may find it's the amount is so low that it wouldn't be worth the extra work, journal entries, um, audit adjustments, things of that nature. But I'm happy to tell you um, what is remaining if you reach out. Um, also in submitting, for these invoice reimbursements, it requires 100% documentation, um, backup documentation. Um, it also requires um, copies of general journal entries, copies of audit adjustments if you have to make them, and um, updated or the most recent signed time and effort certifications if you are billing for salaries and benefits. Um, please do not hesitate to reach out. The window is um, limited for these funds. Um, if you have already billed to your FY23 funds, um, you can return those funds. We'll reapply them to your grant so you can draw down from the 22 funds. And if you're unsure how to do that, please, again, just reach out. I will put my um, contact information in the chat as soon as I'm done. Also, we still have a number of past due FY23 um, year end reports, and we are um, going to be opening the FY24 very soon or in July. So you don't want to be two years behind. Um, please reach out. I'm happy to help get those done. Also, we um, will be looking at MOE. And if you need help with your exceptions, allowable exceptions, um, I and the rest of our team can help with that as well. Um, we just need to hear from you. So please, um, we're here to assist and just, um, just need to know. We can set up times, Zooms, phone calls, whatever you need to get this work completed. Thank you. Clearly, I'm not Megan Dicta. She has a conflict today and is unable to um, make our office hours today. But she did update her slides um, from last month. So um, the AEFLA grant is ending 6.30.24. So to make sure folks are reminded about that. And then the MJRP, Strengthening Main Workforce Grants and College Career Success Coordinators, those contracts are being extended through 6.30 of 2025 next year. And then she does have some upcoming deadlines for FY24 reports of April 30th and July 15th. If you have specific questions related to those grants, um, please do reach out to Megan Dicta with those questions. She'll be more than happy to help. 
For career and technical education, Melissa Sherwood and Emily Dowdy have conflicts today um, for this month's office hours. So they've provided me the information that I need to share regarding career and technical education. So they are currently reviewing local needs assessments and providing feedback on a rolling basis. They would like you to remember that your local needs assessment must be used to inform your FY25 Perkins application budget. And they expect FY25 Perkins applications to open within the next two weeks. So look out for an announcement email from Melissa Sherwood next week. And then a final reminder to submit your FY23 final Perkins final expenditure reports as soon as possible in grants for me. And then for our office and school and supports, Christian, are you here? Hi, I'm here, Jeanette. Um, hey, Julie. Christian, Christian is at the convening in Maryland for Stronger Connections. Um, welcome, everybody. Just to put a name to a face, I'm Julie Smythe with the Office of School and Student Supports. We oversee those of you who are Ease Maine um, grant recipients, Stronger Connections grant recipients, and Chapter 333 Community Schools. If you have any questions, um, Christian4 is your contact, but he is away today. I will put my email in the chat. Thank you for all you do. And for those of you who are Ease Main um, business managers, we would love for you to pencil in July 30th and 31st for an annual convening that it would be great for you to attend. And if you're not sure if you're an Ease Main recipient, you can reach out to me separately. Thank you, Julie. So are there any additional questions from anybody on the call that you would like to ask the team since you have them on the call? Thank you for putting your email in there, Julie. Appreciate it. While folks thinking if they have any questions, just a reminder, we do have team office hours. So here we have a variety of office hours provided from um, federal programs team members. So the schedule is there. You can register for those for content specific office hours. And then within the slide deck, um, we have our contact information of the primary contacts for each of our grants. So that is also there for your convenience. Are there any final questions before we close the meeting? Jeanette, there's a um, question in the Q&A. What is the date for Title I-A carryover computation? And unfortunately, I'm going to have to get that answer for you, Patty, from the program. And what we'll do, Patty, is um, when we send this slide deck out, usually we post it to our website and we also send it to Joanne Allen at Maine ASPO. We'll include that question with an, a response. So Joanne has it and we will be able to send it out to everybody so they have it. Any other questions? All right, I am going to stop the recording and um, end the meeting. Thank you very much for joining us, and we will hopefully see you next month. Thank you very much.